What's going on YouTube? So it's August 10th, it is the release day for AMD's new Threadripper high-end desktop CPUs. We've got the 1920X for 800 bucks, the 1950X, the 16 core, 32 thread, top of the line, king, current champion of the entire market. Uh, again, you know, hitting retail today and the performance numbers, the actual reviews are out. And as expected, I made the, you know, splash screen or whatever, make room for the new king yesterday evening. I'm sure a lot of you guys saw the writing on the wall as well in terms of, you know, a new undisputed performance champion in terms of high-end desktop workstation class CPUs, really for all tasks outside of gaming, which has yet to be optimized, brand new platform, brand new chips, and we've seen a ton of optimization take place with AMD's Ryzen over the past four months. And surely we'll see the optimization take place, you know, with regard to gaming uh, on this platform as well. But in terms of just sheer capability of these CPUs and the value on offer, we really do have a new undisputed king. The uh, Socket TR4 has got a ton of legs, a ton of longevity. You know, AMD's already said that we're going to see seven nanometer, seven nanometer plus, Zen two and three CPUs, plop right in this socket, boot it up, hit the ground running. And like I mentioned in my last video, that increase you know, in transistor density is going to lead, at least in my opinion, if, if their own roadmap has anything you know, to go by at all, uh, based on their Starship CPU for the server market, again, same socket as this one, will probably have four Zeppelin modules on a chip, Two of those likely to be disabled on Federer for 2.0, if you will, with you know 12 cores per Zeppelin 2.0 module. So we're looking at basically having Q1 2018 Federer for CPUs that have got up to 24 cores, 48 threads with the Zen 2 architecture, better IPC, you know, clock for clock performance, higher frequencies, lower power usage, etc and it just gets better and better from there with a phenomenal starting point today, phenomenal pricing in the face of really what is just, in my opinion, a lackluster effort on Intel's behalf, you know, in response to what AMD has been throwing at them in terms of value propositions in the mainstream market recently, and now really invading and taking over the high-end desktop workstation ultra enthusiast market. These chips have got, you know, three and a half gigahertz on all cores out of the box, four gigahertz boost, um, you know, 4.1, 4.2 boost using XFR, depending on your cooling solution, and are absolutely toe-to-toe, -to -toe, if not better than Intel in terms of performance clock for clock in workstation productivity, creativity, slash, you know, type workloads that people that are buying these CPUs are going to be using them for. And gaming, realistically, unless you're playing at 144 hertz or greater refresh rate, these even at launch are still going to, to be just fine. So if you're one of those consumers that, that, you know, does a mixed workload, that likes to do your productivity and your creativity stuff on your machine, your video editing and rendering and compression and decompression of files and all of that different stuff that requires a lot of, you know, paralyzed processing power and cores and threads, this is going to be phenomenal for you for those workloads. And again, unless you're playing on really higher than 144 hertz monitor out of the gate at low resolutions, which I don't know why anybody, you know, it's not realistic for somebody to go out and buy like a GTX 1060 or an RX 480 and $1,000 on their CPU. That's disproportionate in terms of allocation of resources. And it's not realistic in terms of a, of a PC build that, that most people would actually build. So more than likely people that are going to buy these systems are going to be buying and pairing them with 4K resolution displays, ultra wide, you know, 2K, 21 by 9 aspect ratio ultra wides with a, a greater number of pixels in 1080, 1080p and also a beefier GPU 
uh, than a lot of these reviewers are using for, for measurements to kind of gauge gaming performance out of the gate, which again is yet to be optimized. But in terms of performance, uh, you're going to be absolutely fine gaming with these. Uh, at anything, I would say, you know, again, sub 144 hertz and anything over that, you really should just go by yourself. This is the only case I'd ever recommend an Intel CPU right now. But if you're looking at short-term gaming, highest refresh, you know, re refresh rates possible at 1080p, you're looking to go buy a KB Lake, you know, 7700K for three, four hundred bucks. Clock it up to five gigahertz and then get your best, your best refresh, you know, rate, uh, you know, frames delivered to your to your monitor per second. Um, you might have some frame dips that, that, that you know, Ryzen even or Threadripper wouldn't otherwise have because of the lower CPU core and thread count uh, on that Intel 7700K. But in terms of maximum theoretical frame rates, that's still the go-to and the best value if you want, again, super high, you know, um, refresh rate gaming is your, is your primary concern. Outside of that, I would tell you, go with AM4 for the mainstream, go with TR4 for the high-end desktop. You've got, again, a, a phenomenal performance today, only getting better with optimization. You've got a phenomenal road path in front of you in terms of upgradability with future CPUs. And anybody, even the staunchest, biggest Intel fan in the world today can't look at you straight-faced and tell you that you know future Intel CPUs coming out are going to work on the motherboards that you're going to buy today for, for, for socket 2066 you know currently they use the x299 pch you know platform controller hub and as we've recently seen with socket, uh, socket 1151 with coffee lake coming out every time intel promises something uh you know or or eludes you know we're going to make this make this available on this socket they, they pull the rug out from you once again and make you buy another motherboard with the Series 3 chipset now on Socket 1151 and very likely to probably do the same thing to those consumers buying or, or having, you know, had purchased sometime in the future, you know, a Socket, Socket 2066 motherboard today or in the near future and, and putting in a KB Lake X or, or, or a uh, Skylake X part in those motherboards. You know, they've said, Intel have said, we're going to support three generations of CPUs in this socket 2066, but they did not specify if it was going to be, you know, compatible with the current PCH uh, X299. And so they could not be lying and still make you go out and buy yet another motherboard when Coffee Lake or, uh, you know, the eighth generation of architectures comes to that platform whenever uh, you know Cannon Lake or the 10 nanometer die shrink comes to that platform if ever and I just don't see that happening honestly I see Intel continuing to be arrogant and until AMD really just beats them into the mud which is going to happen unfortunately for them at least with their current value proposition and their plans for their upcoming CPUs performance uh, per dollar relative to what AMD is offering, transparency in terms of an upgrade path, you know, future optimization. Again, right now it's kind of best case scenario for Intel versus AMD, especially with this new platform. Developers, again, have yet to take hold and take advantage of all of these cores and learn how to really utilize this stuff in a best case scenario. Um, but that will happen with games being developed today, applications getting, you know, patches and, and worked on all the time. Windows scheduler, I'm sure as well. Everything has a lot of room for optimization with brand new, two brand new chips today on a brand new platform. And, you know, that's all I'm gonna say in terms of performance, it's currently king. You can't beat it right now. Intel has no answer for a 16 core, 32 thread CPU. And it's crazy because the efficiency of these chips has got to be an even, I mean, I don't want to say a, an even more critical blow to Intel, but they're just getting beat up from every possible angle right now. You've got a 16 core, 32 thread CPU and the 1950X that even overclock at four gigahertz, getting like 3,700 points in Cinebench, which is ludicrous, is using less power than a 10 core, 20 thread, 6,900, 
X or 7900X, whatever it is, their 10 core, 20 thread part Skylake X right now. And that has to really burn Intel, both literally and figuratively, because they're, they are burning up those CPUs, boy, with, you know, a lot of, lot of juice. And uh, I, I can't even, you know, fathom what that 18 core, 36 thread monster is going to consume in terms of power. You better have one hell of a power supply to, uh, you know, even power the CPU. You might have to get a low spec GPU to go along with it just so the system will boot properly. But um, yeah, these, these CPUs guys are awesome. You know, basically you've got uh, two of these, you know, uh, eight, uh, you know, eight core CPUs tied together. And uh, again, you know, two of those Zeppelin dies are disabled on these, you know, these third for CPUs. Um, you know, but it's the same socket uh, as SP3 for the server platform. So if they wanted to, they could put out chips today even that had more cores and more threads by simply enabling some cores and threads on those other Zeppelin modules. And I think they have the power availability on socket TR4 because it's the same physical socket. I think it's 4,094 pins, but they could get the same kind of power delivery there if they wanted to and release even greater uh, core and thread count parts today, but certainly again, we'll see that with Zen 2, uh, you know, cores being used in upcoming parts on this socket. And uh, yeah, that's basically it, guys. If you, if you, you know, have any idea, uh, there is one question I couldn't find an answer to, and it was at stock speeds, you guys know, you know, the, the Ryzen CPUs, uh, the thread for CPUs, even their server CPUs, I believe, will have XFR enabled, which means that the cooling is sufficient that the chips will boost automatically over their maximum boost clock. Um, it's a single core, I know, for all Ryzen CPUs. Now, on Threadripper, again, you've got the two Zeppelin modules with eight cores apiece. And if you have an answer to this, if you have a link to this, let me know below. I really appreciate it. But I want to know if you're able to get, because of that, one core per Zeppelin module with XFR. So are you going to have two cores that reach, you know, 4.1, 4.2 2 gig, 2 gigahertz on a Threadripper CPU? Um, or is it just a single CPU core? You know, XFR picks one out of those 16 cores or 12 cores and boosts that one core. Or again, is it boosting one core per Zeppelin module? So if you guys can find an answer to that, I'd appreciate it. If you're considering this platform, I think it's golden. Uh, again, you know, uh, performance, longevity, value, uh, ECC, memory, which Intel does not offer on Socket 2066. If you're very serious about, you know, critical workloads, uh, ECC memory can be, you know, uh, error correcting memory can be, can be huge for you. Uh, it's not on offer with Intel right now. You've got 64 PCI Express 3.0 lanes that are, that are embedded, you know, in the SOC itself. The memory controllers do not require an external PCH to add additional lanes. Um, and that goes from even eight core parts that will that'll be available here shortly, all the way through the entire product stack. The entire feature set of the platform is unlocked, regardless of how much money you spend today. Um, you got if you get on the platform, you get all the features. So you can run multiple, you know, M.2 NVMe SSDs and RAID configuration uh, with, you know, 4X PCI Express 3.0 bandwidth. You can also run, uh, you know, dual or, or even, you know, three or four GPUs using, you know, the full PCI Express 3.0 16X bandwidth um, on up to three of those at, at least. And, um, you know, that's just something that, that Intel currently cannot offer. We'll see what they can bring to the table again, like later in September when they release their 12, 14, 16, and 18 core Skylake X parts. But as of today, um, I, like I say, it's, it's a clear win for the new champ, the new king, undisputed of the high-end desktop and basically of, of personal computing in the world right now. You're looking at your new champion, your new king over here, the 1950X for a thousand bucks on a platform that has a lot of legs and is doing phenomenal uh, today. So, uh, you know, I, I worry about Intel because, you know, by September, you're going to see some of these optimizations, you know, having had been rolled out um, through UEFI BIOS updates from 
uh, motherboard manufacturers. I'm sure they'll get updated a GISA code just like Ryzen has gotten. So, um, you know, I, I've yet to see what maximum clock speeds are for RAM. But again, all these chips are unlocked. You know, the RAM is also able to be overclocked on these systems. So I'd love to see what maximum performance is on these and how optimization continues to improve performance, especially when those, you know, higher core and thread count Skylake X CPUs do show up. They should be even more ready and prepared to do battle with those CPUs. I mean, on a dollar, you know, to performance, you know, sheet, it's going to be an absolute slaughtering. But I think also just in terms of performance, you're going to see it get even better and better for these uh, Threadripper CPUs based on Zen, based on this new platform. Again, this is day one. So these numbers really are best case scenario in terms of relative comparison, you know, for Intel to their CPUs. And it should only get better for AMD CPUs and, and begin to look worse, you know, relatively speaking for Intel, especially on a dollar to performance, you know, kind of a, a scale. So if you guys have um, any other opinions on this, any thoughts, any questions for me, let me know. I will show you guys a video pretty soon here of the video editing machine build I did for work recently and I had uh, the parts out in a couple 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 videos ago showed you guys it's just a uh, Ryzen R7 1800 or no 1700 CPU and uh, didn't use an aftermarket heatsink or fan with that just use the stock Wraith Spire cooler and uh, I'll show you some clock speed some numbers on that have it paired with a GTX 1070 it's not really gonna be a workstation CPU and they're using it for low resolution video editing anyway so this need to be able to do low resolution video editing quickly and I'm sure that you know Premiere Pro with the program they're using you know with CUDA acceleration a GTX 1070 paired with a you know a nice clock speed 8 core 16 thread mainstream consumer CPU should do the task just fine so look forward to that hope you guys are all doing well out there and if you have the money and you have the need for highly paralyzed workloads, today is your day. Go out and get yourself a Threadripper. Hope you guys enjoyed this video as always. I'll catch you in the next one. Peace out.